Okay, so um, this is actually a pretty chock full section. And I'm thinking, do I, uh, can I move the screen now? Yes. Okay. Oh, can I say something? We have someone new joining us today. Hi, Thank Sarah. You. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. I noticed she has a cat, so I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> now, wait, uh, Rabbi? Yes. Does she have the cat or does the cat have her? With cats, it's hard to tell. <laughs> I, I've always thought that whenever I see a cat, they're just, just sitting there wishing they were larger <laughs> so, they could, so they could eat you. Uh, I'm a dog person, what can I say? Uh, I, try, I, I can't move the screen. Somehow. Oh, here. I was moving, thanks. They now okay. do it. All right, well, um, let's just go through uh, verse uh, six. That's going to take, if we get through that section, we're going to be very lucky because that is one of the most famous passages in this part of the Torah. So, um, who would like to volunteer to read? We need a broker first. Oh yeah, oh yes. Thank you, Stan. I say the I say the bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kishanu B'Mitzvotav Yisivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah. Amen. And why Thank don't you, you for uh, Sarah's sake? Uh, Translate that into English uh, so she understands it. What sure, we okay. Um, you know, there may be other people who need to understand it too. Right. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who uh, sanctifies us with commands and has commanded us to be immersed in the words of Torah. The Sukh actually which is the operative term there, is in modern Hebrew, means um, addicted. Ah. Uh, so. yeah, R Rabbi Rose used the word to busy ourselves. <laughs> okay, you know, I normally agree with Rabbi Rose, but on that one, I'm gonna say busy ourselves is too trivial. Yeah, um, I agree. It, 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 the, I wouldn't say addicted, but um, in modern Hebrew, that's that's a colloquial usage for the word asuk. Um, uh, to be, it's it's its root actually is in in business. You get um, your career or your um, your livelihood something that you are asuk in. You are committed to. Mm -hmm. uh, so that. That's uh, where that word comes from. All right. But wait, let me say one thing. Sure. But it, it seems to me that it's the practice of doing it as opposed to the particular learning from it that is the most important thing. The fact that people are doing it repeatedly. And I think that's what he meant by busy ourselves. that, that uh. it, it's something we do as opposed to something that we get something from. That's that's fine. I go along with that. Okay. Uh, busy. All right. I, I, I so he's pl he's playing a little. I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. It's a little cute. Okay. So although I'm not against cute. All right. So uh, will somebody uh, volunteer to read through um, verse six, please? All right. <laughs> Dan, you're on. I'm on. The family heads in the clan of the descendants of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, one of the Josephite clans, came forward and appealed to Moses and the chieftains, family heads of the Israelites. They said, the Lord commanded my Lord to assign the land to the Israelites as shares by lot. 
and my Lord was further commanded by the Lord to assign the share of our kinsman Zelophehad to his daughters. Now, if they marry persons from another Israelite tribe, their share will be cut off from our ancestral portion and be added to the portion of the tribe into which they marry. Thus, our allocated portion will be diminished. And even when the Israelites observe the Jubilee, their share will be added to that of the tribe into which they marry, and their shares will be cut off from the ancestral portion of the time. So Moses, at the Lord's bidding, instructed the Israelites, saying, the pleas of the Josephite tribe is just. This is what the Lord has commanded concerning the daughters of Zelophehad. They may marry anyone they wish, provided they marry into a clan of their father's tribe. Okay, so let's, let's stop here for a second. So, uh, what, can anybody describe what the situation is? There's a problem here. And uh, the, the text is pretty clear, uh, I think, about what the nature of the problem is. Uh, when it comes to inheritance, throughout much of history, um, inheritance was ruled by a, 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 a policy that is called primogeniture, which is to say that, that property passes through the eldest son. I was just watching the other day, um, Sense and Sensibility on uh, the, the movie form, the Jane Austen novel. And that novel revolves around the fact that uh, the father dies with uh, ins instructing his son to take care of the daughters but there's nothing written, there's nothing specific. And so when uh, he does in fact pass away, uh, his less than lovely daughter-in-law prevails upon the son not to honor the father's wishes. And the, 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 the story turns on uh, what happens to, uh, to women who cannot inherit. Now, it turns out very well because it's a Jane Austen novel. And after all the plot and character complications, in the end, it turns out okay, but it didn't always in real life. So here we have the same problem here. The father dies and needs to pass on the land holdings of his family. But by tradition, by common practice in the ancient Near East, the daughters are not uh, appropriate uh, uh, inheritors. Now, the reason that this passage is so important is that we constantly have to uh, worry about the or or recognize the the uh, complications of uh, ancient cultures where women don't have the same status as they do today. Uh, although I'm. I want to point out that when I say today, that's in quotes, because there's still plenty of places all around the globe where women don't have uh, the proper status in order to inherit uh, or to own property and so forth, although it's less common than it once was. But there are still plenty of places where that is the standard. Um, so it's not that this is uh, uniquely part of the frame of the Torah. But there's a solution. 
that the Torah proposes. What's the solution? If the daughter, daughters of Tzilochan cannot inherit, what's the solution? And while, but before, we, before we get to the solution, what, what would be the problem if they can't inherit the land? The, the, since he had no uh, living sons, yes. the land would go back to the tribe itself and the family would lose their inheritance. As, as I understand it, <coughs> so, uh, I think that's what the problem would be. Yeah, and, and why is that a problem, Stan? Well, then the daughters are left with no means of support. They no longer have their father. They have no male relatives of their own generation uh, in the family. And so they would be destitute. Well, that, well, they would be destitute unless they attach themselves to another uh, uh, tribal grouping, which is what the solution is that the, the text comes up with. You have to marry in such a way that the the land can be can be retained. Why is that the problem? I mean, all right, so women don't own land. That's not unusual in the ancient world. What there's a larger problem. Well, the diminishment, I suppose, the diminishment of their uh, land holdings, uh, if, you know, they have to be assured of the fact somehow that, that the, the tribe, uh, the daughters here, uh, that that tribe um, does not diminish itself either through membership or through land. You're, uh, you're on the right track. Uh, what, when you say diminishment, what do you have in mind? that uh, should they marry someone from another tribe, that they uh, leave their own tribe and um, in some way that diminishes, well, of course, then they don't belong to their father's tribe anymore because they go with their husbands and then their land also is, is diminished because of that or the holdings. You are like, in, you, you are like a kiss away, Judy. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Rabbi. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes. I'm, I'm kind of thinking, is it the problem they want to prevent the movement of land from one tribe to the other? Otherwise, yeah. if the movement will occur, there will be a changes in the uh, size of its tribe, uh, tribal land. You are so close. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe how close you are. How does this section start? It starts with the God apportioning the land to all the tribes. What would be the problem if a section of one of the tribes lost its land? Well, its status would be diminished, and uh, and its wealth would be uh, basically animals and uh, land in well, those that, days. That's but, true. But also, the land could be broken up. It depends what yes. area of land they lost, but it could be split in half. I mean, so it could separate the community itself. Well, the the plan, the division of the land is not just happenstance. It is an intentional decision uh, on the part of God. The, the, all of the tribes receive their apportioned section of the land. And the, and the interesting thing about it is even in the period of the Jubilee, when uh, land reverts back to its original owners, you would not be able to do that in this case because the original owners have disappeared. They're all dead. So what do you do when uh, you can't, well, let's, let's back it up a question. Why would it be a problem? Let's speak about this from a theological point of view. Why would it be a problem if the original apportionment 
of the land ordained by God would somehow be changed. Yeah, Remy. I think if, like you said, it's ordained by God and yeah. it cannot be, the size could not be changed. That's the instruction of God. And to me, if the tribal lands changes, there's going to be friction. There's going to be, uh, it could be war. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of problems that will be created from the movement of land from one tribe to the other. Yeah, you know, from this point of view, let, let's go to a little bit of a, what might be a, a larger problem. Uh, on what grounds, from the standpoint of the Torah, does Israel have the right to uh, any portion of land anywhere? God grants it to them. And the Torah goes even further to, as to say that each nation has its apportioned territory. All of this has to do with a, uh, a, an arrangement that is set up by God and which is meant to be, um, I don't know if I can say permanent, but it has, it's not just the result of historical accident. There are all sorts of things like this that are determined by God and therefore one changes them very lightly. For example, just to give you, a, a, you know, what might seem an off the wall example to start with. Does anybody remember the story of the Tower of Babel? And how does it, that's, what is the, the uh, pivoting or the turning point of that story? It's that from, from a uh, folkloristic point of view, it's a way of explaining how each nation has its own language. And those languages uh, were in danger of being, of disappearing if this tower was going to be built. So in, in another, even in another uh, domain, there is a very, you might say a um, non-political but conservative view that the world is set up with certain divisions, certain cultures, certain languages, certain territories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are ordained by God and which have some kind of special status. Now, you can imagine that even though that might be the, the, the point, there might come a time when uh, having no, no flexibility, Bella, uh, no flexibility at all would be a problem. And this is one of them. If in this case of so the daughters of Zulokhad, uh, cannot inherit the land, then it then the structure or the division of territory that God has ordained is going to be flouted. It's going to be it's going to disappear. It's going to be disobeyed. So even though there is a kind of um, static view of who lives where and languages and territories and so forth, all of which are ordained by God. Even so, sometimes you have to fudge it a little bit. <laughs> you have to introduce some level of flexibility. And here's one of them. Now, the interesting thing about it is, what does this say, say about 
the the rule of primogeniture of of uh, territories and so forth going through the oldest son. That's the general principle in the ancient world. How, when that runs up against the uh, division of land, let's say, uh, ordained by God, which principle wins? The one ordained by God, right? The one ordained by God, right. And so primogeniture goes out the window. Now, I think this is sort of interesting to note because what it's saying is that in the conflict of values between general culture and Israelite culture, Israelite culture takes precedence. This is, you can imagine how important this would be in, as a general principle. Uh, there's so many times when as Jews, we have to make a determination when two principles, two uh, moral or, or theological principles come into conflict with each other, one of them from the Jewish tradition, one of them from general culture, how do we resolve those conflicts? Well, it, the, the general culture does not automatically win. The Jewish culture is strong enough so that that becomes the governing principle. Being the exception to the rule is part of being uh, a member of the Israelite or Jewish people. We are constantly in that position of being the exception to the rule. And we try to, uh, to uh, coexist, but when push comes to shove, if the principle is important enough, we will make changes that support what we think it is that God is doing. Yeah, Remy. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I have a question on what you just gave us. Can you give us an example about this Jewish culture principles versus uh, non-Jew and the Jewish uh, uh, sure. belief system prevails? Well, you know, there are so many examples. Some of them are very, very important. Some of them don't seem quite so important, but really are. I mean, there's, 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 there is, my, my grandmother would have said there are skinny eight of them. So I'll give you an example. Oh, Judy, yeah? May, may I give an example that has been really sure. important to me? Sure. Okay. It's the ultra Orthodox community that will, um, many members, not all, but many members and many of their leaders, rabbis, right here in this country, in New York, who will not abide by the um, uh, no crowd, no crowd, no mask uh, assemblage when it comes to their observance of, let's say, a, fame, uh, a rabbi's funeral or uh, their wedding or yeah, other yeah. communal issues. And I same thing is true in Israel, apparently where uh, the uh, police have been called out there to try to manage these ultra-Orthodox, some of the ultra-Orthodox in the community there who will not obey these rules to keep the pandemic down. Rabbi, now, that's, can I that's give another one? No, go ahead. Yeah, um, ba back before the internet, uh, I would sometimes go to New York merchants uh, for camera equipment. And many of the houses that you would go to, like what, 47th Street photo or something, right. would be owned by Jewish people. Now, the biggest business day of the week in those days in the United States was Saturday. But those businesses closed at 3 p.m. on Friday and didn't reopen again until Sunday 
for observance of Shabbat and not working on Shabbat. And I don't know that, that that would have been true for any Orthodox person, I think, not just the uh, ultra-Orthodox. Well, and it might even be true for some who are not Orthodox, but um, that's, a, that's a good example. Well, but it seems to me that's, that's kind of an opposite example. That's just what I was about to say. Say more about that, Jim. Well, the, the, the Orthodox uh, camera owners are following, not following the community, but following the bigger principle. I thought of one, and that is are not re being required to wear a yarmulke at Beth Israel. Because generally, that's the rule that you wear a yarmulke. You know, that is such an interesting example because, you know, um, I'm just, you, you all know that I just had a birthday, I turned 70. And I'm, I've been around long enough to remember when in reform congregations, it wasn't just that you had a choice to wear a yarmulke or not, but you did not wear one because it was not the reform practice. We had our own kind of small O orthodoxy. Nowadays, we, in the reform movement, we are what uh, some people used to call warm to tradition. And people wear yarmulkes and so forth. But back in the day of what they used to call classic reform Judaism, you didn't do that. Nobody wore for it. And in fact, if you wore a yarmulke, you were asked to remove it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so things, these things change a lot. But what I want to get to here is that in the in the uh, in this case, the idea of, of the daughters of Tzolokha is that in the conflict between the general culture and Israelite culture, there was a necess perceived necessity to preserve following the Israelite culture. Why? Because the integrity of the Israelite people was at stake. If parts of the Israelite people lost their land holdings or if tribes disintegrated, that was a real problem from the standpoint of God's ordaining a certain structure for, um, for the Israelites. Remember that going all the way back to the uh, wilderness experience, how the tribes were set up in the spokes of the circle with the, uh, the altar in the center and so forth, that was all meant to create a certain kind of sense of community integrity, the integrity of the community, not to say, you know, a moral um, integrity. And when- <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry? Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry. So um, the idea that there was a kind of ideal arrangement of the various components of the Israelite people was not something that happened just all of a sudden when they uh, went, went into Canaan. It had been part of the idealized history of the wilderness experience. <laughs> So um, you can, the integrity that I'm talking about here is that there is a, a sense in which uh, the Jewish people is settled or structured in such a way that its parts have a certain relationship to each other. So now in this, in this case, if the daughters of Tzolchan do not inherit 
that idealized structure is broken. It is dissipated in some way. So the tradition is flexible enough to say, okay, it's more, more important to maintain the idealized structure of the community than it is to follow the, this notion that women don't get to inherit land. And so, although normally that might be an okay principle, in this case, where it comes up, butts up against maintaining this um, uh, structure God has ordained, it gives way. Okay. Is this, is this also um, to discourage people from intermarrying between tribes? It's well, I don't, not necessarily. I mean, they come out they best if they, if they do, it right? It depends on what happens to the land. But the, so the, final, the final statement in six. Yeah. They may marry anyone they wish, provided they marry into the clan of their father's tribe. Well, that's, that's part of what we're talking about. So there, it's encouraging people to do that because otherwise that's the, land... the static quality of the arrangement. Yeah. See, so now the, 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 the arrangement is static, but there is a, there are points where exceptions are made. Like in the case of these women who were not allowed to, at least would not normally be allowed to inherit. Now I want to add one more level to this, which is the criticism sometimes well founded that um, the position of women in the Torah is not what we would say it ought to be from a modern point of view uh, is not exactly as uh, ironclad as we might think it is. Because here, where um, if you were to follow that sort of notion, the integrity of the allocation of land would be uh, uh, stressed or diminished in some way that turns out to be a higher principle in the question of whether or not women can inherit land. And in, in this case, women can inherit land. That's more important because it helps to maintain the integrity of the people as a whole. So um, the attitude towards women is not quite as ironclad as you might think. That is something that's important to bear in mind as we move forward into um, more modern history. And again, uh, the uh, ancient notions, if you want to call them that, are challenged by changing outside uh, conditions or principles. What we're getting at, yeah, Judy, go ahead. Um, the I'm muting myself here. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So there were three of us with hands up. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I called on Judy first, but I'll okay. get to the other of you in just a minute. Just briefly, I'm a little bit confused. Could you clarify how the flexibility is shown towards these women? You're allowed to inherit. Uh, but okay, so they're not allowed to inherit if they marry outside the clan. Is that correct? That's right. And they are allowed to, of course, if they marry someone within the clan, which they are encouraged to do. Right. The general principle is that women don't inherit. And in this all. case, they, they can inherit because if they don't inherit, then the integrity of the apportionment of land 
that God ordained is disturbed. Okay. So there is, there is a larger principle than whether or not women can be landowners, even though in general practice, in those days in the ancient world, women were not landowners. In order to, to maintain the integrity of what God has ordained as the structure of Israelite society, that is that trumps the question of whether or not women can inherit land. So there's no flexibility there as far as I see that uh, in that comment. I don't disagree. I think that's correct. But I don't see where that's flexible. Well, it's flexible because if they didn't allow that, then women wouldn't inherit the land. So in number three, their share will be cut off from their ancestral portion and added to the portion of the tribe. So it sounds like from there, they are inherited. Okay. okay. Yeah, the, there's, uh, maybe it's not clear. There's, you know, the family consideration and then the tribe consideration. Okay. So uh, the okay. family retains its holdings because the daughters can't inherit. Okay. So, uh, the, the point here is that there is a conflict of values and uh, in the case where the conflict of values is between the Jewish traditional point of view and the, the point of view of the general culture, the, the Jewish point of view sometimes will take precedence. And you asked me for an example, Judy, before. I'll give you an example. As a congregational rabbi, every year, like clockwork, I would get complaints from parents that the AISD was holding some sort of very important event on Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. One year, I recall that it was a district-wide uh, band competition. And so Jewish kids who were in the school band had to choose between uh, breaking with the, the holiday observance or breaking with their uh, their fellow musicians in participating in this district-wide event. And the, when I would complain uh, to some of the school officials, here's the answer that I would get. Well, there aren't that many Jewish kids. Why should we change the date? It's, this is the inconvenient date for us. Everybody else is, doesn't have a problem with it. It's just a few Jewish kids. So um, what's the problem? Uh, see, here, here's where being part of the Jewish group forces us to choose between the general cultural value or the general cultural practice and what would be dictated by Jewish law or custom. And in the competition between the two sets of values, it's very easy to see that for a lot of people, uh, sacrificing the Jewish practice might be the choice that they would make because the pressures of whether or not your kid can part participate in this very important event or not would be uh, too strong to resist. 
So this is a part of being a minority group in a majority culture. You're constantly making decisions, great and small, when the particular values of Judaism and the values of the larger culture in which you live are in conflict with each other. There are many examples of this. That's a fairly trivial one. I'll give you one that is maybe uh, more, um, maybe more important. Um, in American law, capital punishment is permitted for a whole variety of crimes. In Jewish law, capital punishment is permitted, but the laws of evidence are very strict. You have to have at least two witnesses and the witnesses had to have in the, uh, reminded or informed the person who was about to commit the murder. And this was against uh, Jewish law. And he, I, I suppose he, uh, should refrain from doing it. There was no op option for circumstantial evidence. You had to have a direct eyewitness and that eyewitness had to inform the person involved that they were about to break the law. In American law, that's not so. You can have circumstantial evidence you don't have to warn anybody, nothing of the, of the kind. The reason I, I mention this is from my point of view, capital punishment is an example of a value in the general culture that as Jews, we ought to resist because it is it, it flouts some very important principles of Jewish law. As a, I'm saying, as a Jew, you ought to oppose capital punishment. Um, there are many, many examples like this. This is kind of what Judy was pointing to. And uh, in the case of this section of the Torah, what we are learning is that even in the sort of uh, relatively neutral uh, domain of, of civil inheritance. These conflicts can exist and we are, uh, uh, we learn that there are times when uh, we have to adjust as a result of that. Uh, so, I think Sarah and Stan and maybe. Okay, Sarah, you're up. Um, we were talking about flexibility in in this um, to keep the tribe together. They allow women to inherit um, if they marry within the tribe. Uh, and excuse me if I'm wrong or off base, but I also see flexibility in the commandments of they may marry who they wish as long as it's within the tribe. Um, it, most of the time, women were not given an option um, of who they may wish to marry. Um, so there, there is like a compromise to me of you can't marry outward, but you can inherit and yeah. you get to marry whoever you wish in this group. So to me, that, that showed even more flexibility. So what, what do you think is the rationale for trying to retain the integrity of the various tribes? Why is that important? Why don't we just, um, say, okay, so the Israelite people becomes the Israelite people, and we, we don't have tribal identities. What's the problem with that? 
Um, I think the more that you fraction off communities, the more you lose uh, the traditions, the values of those I, communities. I would agree. There are distinctions or customs from one tribe to another that have to do with the identity of that tribe. You know, these are not um, neutral designations. Uh, Dan was a tribe that was connected with judgment. The very name of the tribe, Dan, means has to do with judgment. Or uh, uh, Binyamin, the son of my right hand, has to do with the question of um, uh, the transfer of tradition from one generation to another. So I think you're very strongly on the right path. It, these, these various tribes had different customs and those customs were important. It's the same example as the question of languages in the Tower of Babel. There is something valuable about difference that uh, we don't want to lose the peculiar or particular customs or traditions of one subgroup or another. And you can see why from the standpoint of, of being an Israelite or being Jewish, that you would make that argument. Because that's constantly the, the conflict that as a, as a Jew, we have to face this, the many ways in which there are pressures for us to give up the distinctive practices that are part of our identity. Does that make sense? Yes, Dan. Yeah, um, what Sarah said just triggered another notion uh, that is okay. against general principle in this case. And that is, I think it was true generally that a woman was not allowed to marry whoever she wanted. It was up to her father uh, to, to choose someone, or if the father was dead, the oldest brother. But in this case, clearly there wasn't a possibility of that. Uh, yeah. And so it didn't devolve, say, to a third cousin or something like that. Instead, the women are allowed within restriction to marry who they want the restriction being it's got to be within our tribe. Yeah, I think that's another way of looking at this question of where is the fudge factor? Where is the, uh, the level of flexibility that needs to exist in order for the entire system to maintain its integrity? Now, uh, this is not a problem in the ancient world only. Part of what I was trying to point out before is that even today, this is an issue for Jews. It's an issue for minority cultures. You know, there are many, many cultural groups that are, for example, in, in the process of losing their languages. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, First Peoples uh, and so forth, where there may only be a small number of people left who speak whatever the language happens to be. And there are a lot of people who are concerned about that. That it's it's a kind of it's a kind of extinction when you lose things like your language or your um, the integrity of where you live or your customs or your traditions, the, the, as those things disappear, the people who carry those traditions disappear also. They become increasingly indistinct from the general run of people. And so this is a general problem that exists with minority cultures. Yeah, Remy. 
Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question to what you just said about the tribes, the 12 tribes, they're all different. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit confused. The Jewish people came from, the present Jews came from the line of Judah. Am I right? And then the other tribes, we don't know where they are or what? Or I'm confused. <laughs> well, this gets very complicated, Grammy. <laughs> And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why it's complicated. Jews, um, how do I put this? When the uh, emancipation comes and Jews are able to enter general culture, they are not restricted to their ghettos or to their little groups. One of the things that happens is they don't have last names. Okay, what is your Hebrew name? My Hebrew name is Chaim Ben Velvel for Esther. Chaim, son of Velvel and Esther. It's not, none of those are last names, but that's how we were always named that, that, that way. But when, you, when Jews entered into the general culture, they had to have last names, so they were at that point, all sorts of people were choosing a family last name. So what name do you think they chose most often? The, the, the name of the city they came from? That was one, yeah. yeah but right. For example, my mother's maiden name was Metz. Uh, there you go. Or how about Bamberger or Hamburger? A lot, that's a lot of, a lot of people do that. But that was not the that was not the most popular one. Well, in my father's case, it was Edelman, obviously, and that meant honorable man. So they would choose something that reflected well on the family. That's true. That's true. And what name did they have chosen that would reflect most well on the family? Judy. So my father's name was Itzkovitz, son of Isaac. Son of Yitzhak. All right, so this is very important because to be to emphasize the the, uh, the one's descendants from a patriarch is high status. Yeah, I'm surprised you guys didn't get this right away. Cohen and variations of Cohen of were the most most popular names that were chosen. Next was Levy. And, and other and variants of Levy. Why? Because you want to assert your descendants right. from the from the group of priests or, or priestly assistants. So uh, you know, those names, all these folks who who say, "Oh, my name is Cohen. I must be descended from one of the priests of Israel." I would say. The chances of that actually being true are very small. Somebody back in the 17th century picked a name for the family and they picked Cohen or a variation of Cohen and there are many. And the same things with Levi. Yeah, Judy. Um Remy, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, so please excuse me if I, if this is not meant that way, but I have a question regarding uh, something that you so wisely asked, which was um, the Jews that were in, to be emancipated, as we were just saying, where did they come from? Did they come from the, all of the, the tribe of Judah, or did they come from all of the tribes, or were the, some of the tribes lost? Well, first and foremost, we all are aware of the 10 lost tribes of Israel. Okay, so we start off from that point. This is the Northern Kingdom. When the Kingdom of Israel existed, it split into two parts, the Northern part and the Southern part. And the Southern part was the, the one that we associate with Judah and with Benjamin. The northern tribes disappeared. They 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 uh, 
integrated into the general culture. Okay. Mm -hmm. So people, anybody who, today who tries to claim that they know which tribe their ancestors were from is repeating a family, it's a Misa, it's a, it's a story, it's a legend. Uh -huh. legend. Nobody knows, nobody knows, okay? Even people who are named uh, some variation of Cohen or Levi, they don't really know. Uh, so that's, uh, that it doesn't rule out that they couldn't be some people who are preserving, uh, I, Kim is telling me it's 115 and we need to stop. But listen, he's been quiet all, all morning. So I'm gonna give the last word uh, uh, to Kirby because he finally, he finally put his hand up. It's a question that will lead us down to a rabbit trail. I'm motivated oh. to ask it because it's verse four, we're told about the year of the Jubilee. Has the year of Jubilee ever been celebrated? There's no documentation of that in the Torah. Is there documentation in the Mishnah or other rabbinic literature? There, the, the Jubilee year uh, was not observed in actuality. It's an, it's an, a, an aspirational uh, value. Now, I think it's probably true to say that there was a, lot, a keen interest in maintaining the integrity of the tribes, but how it might have actually been observed or practiced is not at all clear. So I'm not saying that it could not have been, but it's for, there are no sources that give us exact details about how it might have been enforced. That was a very good answer that kept us from going down a rabbit trail. <laughs> <laughs> I can I congratulate you. <laughs> Thank you, Kirby. After all these years, I've learned something. There you go. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank uh, you so much uh, for all your okay, sharing nice. about my question. Thank you, Judith. Oh, Thank you're you. all very, very, very welcome. Yeah, and you. I hope I see everybody back again next week. Okay. okay. Thank Have you. Have a good care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.